Many years ago, a mentor of mine taught me that when storms of life comes my way, that I need to be still and re respond to the storm, not react to the storm. I am concerned that the unlawful and unjust death this week of a George Floyd has caused millions in our country to react to the injustices of his death. And the sad commentary is that the reaction we see on television as wrong as it may seem is warranted. And you may say, why do I say that, Pastor Felix? I'm saying that because people are tired. Blacks are tired and certain whites are tired and culture is tired. And because people are not sure how to respond, they wrongly reacted by turning peaceful protests into violent ones. For the record, I am not a proponent of any violent protests. People in America have the right to speak their voice. They have a right to be heard, but these protests and voices should be heard in a peaceful, nonviolent manner. We are called to live in peace with each other. And that was the driving force behind the peaceful civil rights movement by Dr. Martin Luther King in the late 50s and the early 60s. My concern for our country and for the church today is that there has been no response to the injustices surrounding the death not only of a George Floyd, but also of an Ahmaud Arbery, leaving the likelihood that these crimes against black in America will continue unless there is a proper response to all the injustices suffered against a people group whose history is plagued with slave from slavery by white America. Please hear me. Injustice against any people group is wrong. I believe it is time for the Church of God to, the ri to rise to the occasion together. This means black church and white church and the Hispanic church and the Asian church banded together to say enough is enough. I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ has redemptive power and life-changing truth. This means the finished work of Christ on Calvary inaugurated the present aspect of God's kingdom. And the church of God collectively has the responsibility to realize God's kingdom on earth. My concern, and, and I want you to hear me say this, we have the responsibility to inaugurate God's kingdom on earth. So I'm going to say this, let us respond by marching together to end racism. Let us respond by marching together to all, end all the injustices against blacks or any person of color or people in general. Let's respond by marching together to end for, for justice, to get justice for the death of a George Floyd and an Amar Arbery. Let us respond by marching together to prevent the death of my black sons and your black sons and other black sons. Let us respond by marching together the prema to prevent the premature death of my grandchildren and your grandchildren and granddaughters. Let us respond by marching together to change the political structures in our country that promote systemic racism. Let's respond by marching together to change the current political regi regimes and install a new president that will stand for all people, God's people, black and white, brown and yellow. Let's respond by marching together to realize God's kingdom on earth where people can live together in peace regardless of the color of their skin. Like many in America, I too am mad. I'm angry, I'm tired of all the madness, but I also believe it is now time to respond, not to react with violence. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, you're a wonderful God. You're an awesome God. And God, it's a difficult time for any pastor to preach, for any leader to speak, because the country is in turmoil and people are hurting and they want answers, God. They want to live in peace. They want to live in harmony. But God, my theology calls for me to realize that the church is the solution to all the problems that the world faces. And the people of God need to stand together and band together. Like Martin Luther King Day, God, he was prompted by something on the inside. He fought from a peaceful perspective, God, because he knew who he was. And he knew he was called to be a change agent. We can foster change, God, but blacks can't do it by themselves. The browns.
can't do it by themselves, God. Yellow can't do it by themselves, God. It takes black, white. It takes all of us coming together, saying enough is enough, God. What we see in culture today is simply a world that is saying we are tired of all the injustices. So we can't say, as wrong as it may seem, we can't say that they're at fault, God. They, they're, they're wanting answers. They're wanting solutions. So Holy Spirit, as your word goes forth today and we look at a text that we looked at yesterday, today we celebrate Pentecost, but let us see this text through the lens of a current set of situation and circumstance. And let us not respond in fear, but in faith, knowing that we serve a great God. So Holy Spirit, we give ourselves to you, God. I rest in you. I rest in you, but I pray for preaching power, God, to stand boldly and prophetically and speak to the people of God today so that we can hear what you would have to say so the church can begin the process of realizing the kingdom of God on earth. We give our hearts and our time to you. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen, amen. I'm trusting that you're praying for me and you're praying for leaders all over the place that we would lead God's people and this world out of this chaos where we find ourselves. So grab your Bibles. If you have your Bibles, grab it and go with me to the book of Mark. We're going to pick up this text from where we were last week. I just want to share two simple things with you this morning that I'm hoping we can see through the lens of what God is saying. So if you go with me to the book of Mark chapter 4, and we delivered this message last week, I just want to recant and reback, uh, review and share a couple of things with you that will hopefully shed some light um, on what the Word of the Lord is saying. Mark chapter 4, look at verse 35. Let me read verses 35 through 41. And it begins by saying this in the English Standard Version. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat as he was, and other boats were with them. Verse 37 says, and a great windstorm arose. I'll tell you what, we're in a windstorm right now. And the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. And he was in the stern asleep on a cushion. And they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? I'm, I'm going to get ahead of myself this morning because I am troubled. And I, I know this as it relates to these United States. If Jesus can speak to the wind and have it obey him, I am confident that there is no circumstance that he cannot speak to and have it obey him. I want you to hear me say that this morning as we go through. I, my wife and I have this conversation a lot where we talk about racism and the injustices in America. And my wife also, uh, oftentimes will say to me, racism will never end and this will never end. We'll always have these people. I'm crazy enough to believe that if Jesus can speak to the wind, <laughs> he can speak to any circumstance that we find ourselves in and put an end to it. We just have to have faith, and we'll talk about that in a little bit this morning. So bear with me. I'm going to try to press through this so we can hear what God is saying. Here are some of the things that we shared with you last week, and I want to review real quick just to bring you up to speed, and I'll land on the two things that I shared. We talked about surviving life's storm. And, and you have to be dead not to know that the United States is going through a storm right now. I mean, this storm is so bad, it started in Minneapolis with the, de the unjust death of one young man that the entire country is rioting because they don't know how to handle the storm or what to do with the storm that we find ourselves. So here's the first thing I shared with you last week. Number one, I said this, that storms come whenever we face a crossroad in our life. And I'm going to say to you, and you've heard me say it in my pre-sermon speech, it's time for a change. I'm just going to say that. 
It's time for a change. If we want to make America great again, I'm going to say we need to return to Christ. <laughs> we, need, that, that we, we don't need to press forward to the crazy stuff that we see going on because whoever, our president that's in office right now, I'm just going to say this boldly, he's doing nothing to make America great again. We need to revert back to Christ to hear what God is saying. And here's what we said about that first point, right, is that storms have a way of entering our lives such that they present us with a crisis of belief and press us to, to press us to a place of obedience with God. Whether the church or the world realizes it right now, we are in the middle of a crisis of belief. And, and part of my statement is really this. What we do next really dictates what we believe about God or what we say about God. So a storm comes whenever we face a crossroads. Secondly, we said this last week. Jesus on board is not to prevent the storm, but to guarantee us that we will make it through the storm. Now, now don't just listen to this through the lens of a sweet by and by, right? Because here is the sub point of that. Salvation is not a guarantee from the trials of the earth, but it's a guarantee of eternity with Christ. That's the sub thing that I said with you, right? So here's, here's the problem with the church and Christian. I might be a little hard on the church today. We are waiting to get to heaven for everything to be over when the goal of God, your kingdom, come where on earth as it is in heaven. So we need to learn how to manifest the kingdom of God on earth. So Jesus on board, it won't stop the, to the storm, but it will tell us that we can make it. So I want you all to hear that this morning. The third thing of, is this. The, the focus of the storm, though it may impact others, is always about you. You got to hear me say this. Where we find ourselves right now with the unrest that we see going on, I get what's happening, but I think it could be formative for us as individuals as well. What we do next dictate what we believe about God. So the focus don't look so much as pointing fingers. Say, God, what do you want me to do? What is my role? What is my um, what is my involvement? How can I foster change? How can I make a difference? And it's not November yet, but I'm going to say this, get up and vote. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say right now. So we can hear this to hear what God is saying. Now, the fifth, the fourth thing I said was this, is that storms are designed to teach us to rest in God during times of difficulty. And my goodness, that's a hard lesson to learn. What does it mean to rest in God? And when we look at the text, we saw Jesus on board that ship in the stern on a cushion, laying his head, resting in the midst of the storm. And I'm going to say this to you. Resting does not necessarily mean all passivity or being passive. We allow God to do the work while we rest in Christ. Which leads me to the fifth thing that I want to pick up and dig into a little bit and share with you this morning. And that is this. Jesus is the only one qualified to calm the storms in our life. I'm going to say it again. Jesus is the only one qualified to calm the storm in our life. And let's go to work here because I want to spend a little bit of time on this point and my final one just to drive some things home. Look at what verse 38 and verse 39 says. Verse 38a begins like this. But he was in the stern, the text says, asleep on a cushion, and notice this, and they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke, and he rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, peace be still, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Now, if you paid attention to the Bible study we did this past Wednesday, and I'm trusting that you'll join us again, this particular point got me in a lot of trouble, right? It, 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 it created some, some unrest among our listeners. It, con it, contained, um, it, it created some unrest among congregants, about members of our congregation, because people thought for some reason, Pastor, you could not have meant what you said, right? Because here's some of the things that I said. Here are my exact words. I said my exact word was this. Please note... The objective of this message is not to tell you that during life storms you can speak to the storm and it will go away. That would be bad theology. 
By ourselves, we can speak to nature until we're blue in our face. If God doesn't intervene, nothing will happen. I said that, right? And, 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 and I'm going to talk about this in a little while because a lot of people heard that, and they know the teaching that they have received in churches. They know what they've learned. They know what they've said. And a lot of us believe we can speak to things, and things will change, and things will happen. I want to go on record as saying I am not recanting my statement, but I am standing strong on my statement, and I want to speak to that a little more boldly today in the midst of everything that we find ourselves in, because there's a major factor in Christendom that believes that words have creative power, and there is some truth to that. Hear me say that. There is some truth to the fact that words have creative power, but I want to go on record as saying that by myself, I am not God. And I want to go on record as saying that by yourself, you are not God, so your words don't have the same creative power that God's words have. Let me just go on record as saying that so we can hear this, okay? So hear me, hear me say this again. It's not my responsibility, and I'm going to add some words, by myself to speak to any storm and think I have the ability to fix it by myself. That's Jesus' job, and I want to be clear about that. So my responsibility, like Jesus on the boat during the storm, is to stop panicking, and I need to grow to the place, listen to this, where I wake Jesus up and I invite him to speak to the storm, and he speaks to the wind, and he says, wind stop, and then there's a great calm over the sea. So I'm saying to the church this morning, and I'm going to keep repeating myself over and over again, black church and white church and Hispanic church and Asian church, it's time to wake Jesus up and allow him to speak to the storm through us so we can experience the calm. I, I want you all to hear me say this. And, 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 and notice the text. When you look at the text, here's what we see in the text, right? Jesus spoke to the wind, the text says. And then there was a great calm. And, and the problem with this theologically is when we look at this, most of us know clearly here's how we apply what Jesus did. We know clearly what Romans chapter 4 verse 17 says. And I want them to put that scripture up so you can kind of see what it says clearly. Here's what the scripture says in Romans chapter 4 17. I have made you father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. It says this, the God who gives life to the dead and call those things that be not as though they were. Now, now I know you probably can't see that scripture, but, but here, here's the thing what we do is we listen to that scripture and, and we, we've created this theology that words have created power because, and, and when we see things that we want in life, here's what the church does. It goes around calling those things that be not as though they no, were, uh, were not. And then when nothing happens, we get heartbroken, we get discouraged, and we say we, we lose faith in God. But if you look at the text carefully, exegetically. The text is speaking about Abraham and the promises that were made to Abraham. The text is not saying that Abraham called anything into being that was not. It says God did. I want to be clear about that. God is the one that was doing the calling. God is the one that was doing the speaking. God is the one that was doing the creating. God is the one that was making everything happen. Matter of fact, let me take you to another scripture. If you were to go to John chapter 8, I'll just put that on the screen. I need my tech crew to kind of hang with me a little bit this morning. Here's what John chapter 8 says, right? So Jesus said to them this, and the reason I want to put this scripture up, if you look at the life of Jesus. Lock into this. Jesus was flesh, but he was God at the same time. I'm going to come back to that. But the flesh Jesus had sense enough to realize that whenever he functioned, it wasn't the flesh doing all the work. It was something that was propelling the flesh. I wish I had a witness here. So here's what he says in John. So Jesus said to them, right? He says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that, watch this, I do nothing of my own authority, but I speak just like the Father has done what? 
has taught me. You've got to get that in your spirit. This is so true of Christ. When you see him going around, it wasn't so much Jesus doing what Jesus did, but it was Jesus allowing God to speak to him. Look at this next text, and, and, and let me make a correction on the fly. That's John 14, right? John 14. Here's what it says. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, right? Listen to what verse 16 says. And I will ask the Father, and look at what the text says, and he will give you a helper to be with you. That word helper is, is, is from the Greek root parakletos or paraclete, which means that what God's going to do is that when we call him, he's going to release, I wish I had somebody in here, his Holy Spirit to come alongside you and to work with you and to empower you. And look at what the next verse says. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. And it says, you know him for he dwells with you and he will be in you. Now, I, I've got to do a parenthetic in here. I expect folk in the world to riot. I do. I expect them to burn buildings down. And I expect them to overturn cars. Why? They don't know any better. Come on, I want you to hear me. But, but I also expect the church of God, who has the Spirit of God in him, to go into the world and do something about what's happening that doesn't look like the way the world does it. And God has released the helper. And we miss that. And we miss that. And here's what the church is doing. I'm going to get to this. They're sitting at home praying for the folk in the world, not doing anything, not realizing that we have the presence of God with us. Let me, let me give you this quick illustration. I am, I, I am a, a BMW enthusiast, and don't hold that against me, amen. Don't hold that against me. I love Beamers. I think that should be the only car on the world, on the road, amen. And so here's the thing with cars. I've got this one BMW that's pretty doggone quick. Now, I love the car. It's a good-looking car. I'll watch that car, but I realize that if I don't get in the inside of the car and turn the key, the car goes nowhere. More importantly, I realize this. I can turn the key all I want, but if the car doesn't have gas in it, it's not going to start, then it's not going to roll, it's not going to go anywhere. So here's what I realize. The gas plays an important role in the car. Doesn't matter how much it costs. Doesn't matter how fast it is. It doesn't matter how smooth it drives, how much it hugs or handles the roll. If it is missing the propellant, oh, y'all going to get this. <laughs> it's not going anywhere. Look at this next scripture. Here's what Acts 1 and 8 says. But you shall receive a propellant after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, right? And then you will become, what? Witnesses. So that propellant is the Holy Spirit. And watch where the witnessing begin. In home, in Jerusalem, then where else? In Judea, then where else? In Samaria, and where else? To the uttermost parts of the earth, right? And then, and then I love this next scripture in John. Here's what John says in John 14 and 12, right? Truly I say to you that whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And I love this phrase in John 14, 12. And greater works than these shall he do. Why? Because I'm going to the Father. So here's how that looks. God goes up to his Father in heaven and he causes his Father to release the Holy Spirit on the people in the earth realm. And what the Holy Spirit does is it empowers the people of God. It empowers the church of God. It empowers the saints of God. Listen to this. Not to react, but to respond. And we miss that. Why? Because here's what we think. The Holy Spirit is all about me having good church. The Holy Spirit is all about me singing good songs. The Holy Spirit is all about me preaching good sermons. And we restrict the Holy Spirit to the inside perimeters of the church while the George Floyds of, Floyds of the world are dying and injustice is being served. While the Amart Arboreys of the world and others are dying and injustices are being served, uh, are being served uh, not being served. And the Holy Spirit people who are filled with the ability to respond are not doing anything about it. I'm telling you, it is time for change. Here's what Philippians 4 says. 
I can do all things through Christ who what? Here's how we read that, though. I can speak those things that be not as were. And we Christianize that verse, and it has no implication for how we live our life in the earth. We miss that. All things through Christ for us is restricted to the inside perimeters of the world, but we don't see ourselves confronting government, and we don't see ourselves changing laws, and we don't see ourselves fighting for justice that don't, that justice is not being served. We don't see ourselves making a difference. So here's the thing about the text. Notice the order of the text. The disciple woke Jesus up, and Jesus spoke to the storm, not the disciples. What am I saying? I'm saying this. Jesus is the only one qualified to calm the storm. Here's what that means. With Jesus on board, let me clear my statement up. With Jesus in my life, I have the ability to allow God to speak through me to power, to situation, to circumstance, as long as the Holy Spirit is in me. And I want us to get that because we miss that a lot. So here's what that means. If we're going to survive the storm, look at this statement. If we're going to survive the storm, we must learn to access Jesus and allow him to speak to the storm. Quick application, and I got one more thing to share, so you got to be patient with me. Imagine what it would look like if all the suburban churches and all the urban churches would come together and say, let's have a prayer meeting to invoke Christ in us. And then we showed up on the streets. Come on, talk to me. We went to the police chiefs, and we went to the mayors, and we went to the governors, and we went to the White House, and we went to places and said, no more. Imagine what that would look like. We would save the young people who are on the street right now, destroying things and changing things and causing havoc, as opposed to retreating in fear. My goodness, this is such a good segue to the next thing that I want to, to, to hear that I want to share with you. And look at the sixth point, and I'm going to wrap this up in a little bit. When facing life storm, here's the thing. Stop engaging Jesus based on fear. Engage him based on faith. Now, let me say, I might mess up your definition of faith a little bit this morning when you hear what I'm about to say, but track with me. So when you look at this text, let me give you a little bit of backdrop about the disciples, then we're going to wrap this up. If you were to back up to chapter 4, verse 1, understand with me that these disciples had just encountered Jesus. They didn't know him the way they should have known him because they had a newfound relationship with him. So in chapter 4, he's teaching them by the Sea of Galilee, and a large crowd is gathering. Now watch the text. Watch the text. Jesus then begins in verse 10, I mean in verse 1 all the way to verse 9, he's speaking about the parables and he's teaching them the parable of a sower who went out to sow. Now don't miss this, don't miss this. The disciples are sitting there listening to the same teaching that Jesus is speaking to the audience. Now what's striking about the text is verse 10, look at verse 10, and when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables. And here's what they said to him. And here's what he said to them. To you have been given the secrets of the, watch this, the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables. So here it is. Here these 12 were hanging out with Jesus. And when Jesus would speak, listen to this, they had no idea what he was talking about. They missed it. Then in verse 13, he would continue speaking to them in parables. And in verse 21, he would look at this. He said to them again about this lamb under a basket. Then in verse 28, he would talk about this parable of a seed growing. And then look at verse 30. He talked about the parable of the mustard seed. But I love verse 33. Verse 33 says, And many such parables he spoke to them, um, um, I spoke a word to them, as they were able to hear it, and verse 34 in my Bible says, he did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. So here's what that is saying to me. He had just called these 12 boys. They were walking with him. They were talking with him. They were hanging out with him. And the whole time they were hearing is he was explaining to them the truth that the kingdom of God is now. But here the shocking thing of the text even though they heard it, 
they were skeptical and it really did not settle in to how they ought to live it out. So, so let me go here. It's like me and you. We come to church every single week and we hear the word, but we go home and when the storm hits, we don't know how to apply. I wish I had somebody in here to apply the word so we can live it out. So the practicum comes, right? The practicum comes. We talked about the practicum. They get on this boat, and they're going in the Sea of Galilee, and the storm comes. And, 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 and as opposed to them responding to the storm, they start to react. They start to bail water out, and they're grabbing the sail, and they're panicking, and they're freaking out because they don't know what to do in the storm. And then listen to this. And then in the midst of all of them doing the work, Peter and Andrew and James and Simon and Judas and Bartholomew, and they're all just panicking, trying to get water out of the boat. Somebody said, where's Jesus? Then those in the stern said, hey, man, he's laying right here asleep. And here's the point I made last week. Sleep. They had an attitude with Jesus. And when they went to wake him, hear me out, they did not wake him with the anticipation that he would do anything. They woke him with the expectation that they would hand him a bucket and he would help them get water out of the boat. And I need to make that clear because here's what I said last week. When I go to Jesus more times than often, I wait till the storm comes and I'm freaking out in the middle of the storm. And my going to Jesus is more times than often based on fear, not faith. I'm scared because my marriage is in jeopardy. I'm scared because they're laying people off on the job. I'm scared because the coronavirus had missed. Depending on where my church is, I'm scared because they're rioting in the street. I'm scared because I'm black. I'm scared because of all this, and I don't know what to do, but all I want to do is hand Jesus a bucket. That's all I want to do is hand him a bucket. I don't want him to use me to do anything about it. Just help me in my fear. My goodness. And Jesus asked him two pointed question. Look at what he says. Look at what he says. And I know this is going a little longer, but look at what he says, right? It says here, he gets to them, and then he, they wake him up. He woke up, and, and here's what he says in verse 40. He says, why are you so afraid? That Greek word, Dialos. Why y'all such cowards? That's what he says. Why y'all? English translation. Bunch of wimps. What's, what's, what's wrong with y'all? And then he says this. Do you have no faith? Now, my problem in interpreting that word faith is I've been tainted to believe that faith is me just believing God to do for me what I can't do for myself. <laughs> but here's what Jesus says, right? Because they had the same problem, right? They, they, they ended up being afraid. They ended up being freaking out, and they started to be afraid. And here's what First Timothy says, that God has not given us a spirit of what? Fear, but of what? power and of love and what else? Of a sound mind. And we miss that, right? So, so here, here's what the church is doing. The church today is no different. We see the rioting in the street and we see the injustices and we see all the stuff that's going on. And here's what we do. We retreat in fear. And then here's what we stay at home in our, in our safe circles. Sick him, Jesus. We hand him a bucket and we want him to go bail water out the ship. And what we forget, here's what Jesus said to his disciples. All this teaching I've been doing about the present aspect of the kingdom, you got to hear me say this. All this teaching that I've been doing you about the kingdom of God is at hand and the kingdom of God is here. And the kingdom of God is like a sower who went out to sow. And the kingdom of God is like a grain of mustard seed. Though it's the smallest, yet it becomes the greatest. And the kingdom of God is this. And the kingdom of God is that. The whole time I'm saying this, lock into this, you didn't realize that I am the fulfillment of the kingdom. Because if you do that, this storm wouldn't have nothing on you. You got to get that. If you knew that, this storm would not have anything on you. 
I want, I want y'all to hear me say that. This storm would have nothing on you. And the disciples missed that. And they woke Jesus out of fear because they didn't realize that, listen to this, God himself was in their midst. God himself was laying on the boat sleep. They thought he was a mere man, and they didn't realize who he was. So here's how I am defining faith. I want you all to see this definition of faith, because this is very, very important that you get. Faith, then, is believing, faith, faith then, is this, is believing that God cares and that he is work, at work in the world, realizing the present aspect of the kingdom on earth. Let, let me go here, let me go here, let me go here. And I'm done. Jesus, get up! Don't you care that we are perishing? And I believe, how dare you ask me if I don't care about you? How dare you ask me if I don't care? Because they forgot the fact that God with them is the true realization of how much God cares. Now, people, I need to drive that point home because I need you to hear me say today that God cares for every single person who bears his image. It doesn't matter what it looked like. It doesn't matter what they did. It doesn't matter how off they were. It doesn't matter how sinful they were, or it doesn't matter how unrighteous they were. God cares. And lock into this. And because he cares, look at what he did. He sent his son to die in their place to prevent us from going to hell. You've got to hear me say this, right? So here's the obligation of the church. If you want my two cents as it relates to this George Floyd situation, God cares about George. God cares about Ahmad. God cares about every single person on the face of the earth who's being served and in justice. And here it is. Because God cares, we should care. And if we should care, if God was big enough to leave his home in glory and come down on earth to redeem us, how dare we sit in our comfort homes and not say anything, not do anything, not respond, not show the love of God. If that is you, I'm going to say this. You're no different than the disciples because you don't know who God is. If that's you, if that ain't my problem, that's them. No, 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 no. If God's people are being served and in justice, it just became your problem because it is God's problem. Because he cares. And he expects that we respond. So God's saying to you just like he said to disciples, don't you have faith? Because faith says, I know who you are, and I know what you can do, and lock into this, and I know where you live. And because of where you live and who I am, you have become the gas in my vehicle. I wish I had somebody. So I've got to go and respond and say, enough is enough. Stop the madness. Stop the injustice. And lock into this. Even like Martin Luther King, if it costs me my life, I've got to stand for what's right. So hear me say today on this Pentecost Sunday, if we're going to survive the storms, the church of God needs to start being the church of God. The people of God needs to start being the people of God and make a difference in the world in which we're living. Salvation is not only about you being saved, waiting to go to heaven. No, 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 no. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Where? On how? Just as it is in heaven. And as long as the people of God is in the earth, his expectation is that we be Jesus to the world. And if God cares, our faith says, we rise to the occasion, black, white, Hispanic, Asian. We, bind, we, bind, we join hands and say no more racism, 
No more injustice. Come on. No more just taking advantage of, advantage of the people of God. All lives matter. Black lives matter. Brown lives matter. I want you to hear me. The people of God matter because they are image bearers. We've got to recognize that. So my prayer today, I know we're hurting. I know we're going through a lot. But hear me say, Jesus cares. And the church of God cares. And if we're going to survive the storm with Jesus on board, let us move in faith, knowing who he is, not in fear. Bow your heads with me. Father, you're a wonderful God. You're an awesome, you're a gracious God, Lord. On this Pentecost Sunday, God, 50 days after your ascension and resurrection, we pray for peace. We pray that you manifest yourself faithfully in the world, God. But you do it through the church. Suburban church and urban church and the midtown church. We got to come together. I believe in the words of Bill Hybels, the church still is the solution. Because we know better. We know better. We know how to respond, not to react violently. So I pray for protesters, God, that they would be safe and they would stop the violence. Let their voice be heard. That's their, they have the right based on the amendments to speak and to protest. They have that freedom. But the church also has a right to confront power and say wrong is wrong. And God, your love is nonpartisan. It transcends Republican parties and Democratic parties and independent parties. It's a kingdom party with a kingdom agenda. So we should go to anyone that's wrong and say enough is enough. So Holy Spirit, help our nation heal. Help our young people heal, God. Help our country heal. We give this to you, God, that you get the praise, the honor, and the glory. It's about you and not about us. Have your way, God, in your word. Name we pray. Thank you.